taking off. People are being way more strategic about their spaces and their learning spaces and they're thinking about gaming and gaming clubs and they're thinking about virtual reality and um, yeah, everything's changed a lot. In fact, I learned a lot watching Zach go through his and just how he was redesigning his classroom to make everything work. Right. Well, that's what got me thinking. And I thought, wow, I would love to hook them up with your um, uh, company to kind of think about some of this before they start just looking at furniture. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. Yeah, there's tons of different options. Actually, ironically, somebody just sent me a virtual reality chair yesterday that was kind of interesting. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll 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 follow up uh, with that. That would be great. That would be great. All right. <clears throat> so why don't we go ahead and get started? We're about five minutes after, so. Uh... We won't give them the professor rule and start 10 minutes after. Um, so, uh, you know, greetings everyone and, and welcome to uh, the next session of the Atlanta Cloud webinar series uh, featuring our friends at Gravity Gaming. Uh, my name is Jeff New. I'm the business and operations lead for the Atlanta Cloud and joining us today is Anna Hansen, who will be taking us through some of the great stuff that they're doing. Um, so I'll let Anna give her introduction um, once I'm, I'm kind of done with some of the logistical things. So this is an interactive session. Uh, there is a chat um, option available, so feel free to either post your questions in the chat or um, you know, kind of ask your questions in real time, and we'll do our best to address them either in stride or, or at the end of the session. Uh, but again, feel free to go ahead and post your questions in the chat. And also, um, you know, I'd like to have folks kind of announce themselves in the chat window with your name and your role and kind of what organization you represent so we can kind of have that for, as part of the, the logs as well. Um, as a reminder, the Line of Cloud webinars are every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Central Time, giving, uh, given different scheduling. Um, pretty consistent in terms of every Wednesday, but sometimes, you know, based on holidays and whatnot, we don't have them, but uh, they're typically every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Central Time, and you can go ahead and look at the announcement on uh, additional webinars that are coming up. Um, next week, uh, we do have uh, a webinar scheduled with um, a student information system called Aladdin that's uh, based out of Ireland, um, so they're doing some great stuff there, so... Uh, Feel free to look at the uh, announcement and you'll see what webinars are kind of in the queue. Um, with that, uh, Anna, please feel free to introduce yourself, share your screen, and, and get started. I'll go ahead and stop sharing on my side. Um, yeah, I'll just kind of get started and say that um, for us at Bytespeed, the transition with Gravity Gaming has really been quite a transition. I'm I'm really proud of the progress that we've made. I will say that um, my friends in Illinois have had a really, really big um, effect on what, what we do and how we do it. Um, I started off down a road. In fact, I don't know how many people know this, but I was, I was at ISTE last year. And I, I ran into Zach Gilbert. And he said, hey, how are things going? What are you guys up to? And I... I said, oh, not very much. And at that point, we had started a gaming line, but we hadn't really done anything with it. And I, to be quite honest, wasn't very excited about it at all. Um, it didn't really speak to me. It was more of a consumer-based type of um, product, and I just didn't feel like it fit our, our company at all. I wasn't excited. Um, so anyways, I was telling Zach about this and he said, oh, that's the coolest thing that you've ever done. And then he started talking to me about gaming clubs and what he was doing in his school and he brought up virtual reality. And, um, I, uh, as he's telling me, that's the coolest thing you've ever done. I'm thinking it is. And I, uh, ran back to the office and said, oh my gosh, you guys aren't going to believe this, but we, there's a really cool opportunity for gaming and education and we need to start an education line that does everything that, we do for bite speed, but with gaming for gravity. And we, we launched very shortly thereafter gravity gaming for education. Um, it, it was a really fun transition and I was really excited and we built up our machines with a five year warranty and free imaging. And I raced off to the next trade show thinking I had it, had it done. 
and uh, I had a VR ready PC package put together. It was one machine and it was VR ready and um, I showed it to people and they said, that's really great. Can you get the headsets for us? And I went, oh, okay. And then I raced back to the office and added the headset into our bundle. And um, again, thought that maybe I was going in the right direction and that I had it and went off to the next trade show only to be asked the, well, that's really great. You guys have a good start there, but what applications are you going to load on there? Um, at which point I went, oh, okay. And I st started working with Zach and he introduced me to a company called Foundry 10. And they are absolutely brilliant. Um, they've done a ton of research on virtual reality and what it can do in the classroom. And so we picked just at random six applications that kind of covered a variety of topics that were educational and put them on a preloaded bundle. And I finally thought I had it done. And then I ran into uh, Jim Peterson, who you guys all know, and he showed me a picture on his phone of a smart table and a broom and a bunch of stuff that was all of this wonderful technology that people invested in that they thought that was going to be impactful and they thought was going to be it only to find out that it wasn't used. There wasn't the buy-in. And as you sit there and go in with new technology, there's always something exciting and new. But the thing that really separates us is the implementation piece. And so for the first time ever at Bytespeed, I had to figure out how to do an implementation. Normally what I've done over the years is put together a package with hardware and then hand it off to the next person and they will go in and figure out how to implement it. But I knew with this package that the only way that I was going to be successful is if I could figure out implementation. So what we started doing was building out a professional development bundle, something where we would come in, we would have the machines, we would have the headsets, and we would strategically work with the teachers or the people that were buying the, the bundle on how to implement this at the school level. Um, and we got a, we have a pretty good start. I'm, what I'm showing you right now is some of our education trainers. Um, I'm really proud of the people that we've got set up um, across the country here. Lucas is brilliant and amazing. He's out in North Carolina. Um, Zach is a familiar face, I think, to most of you guys. Mindy, another familiar face. Um, you're probably not surprised that I went to Illinois I, where I have dynamic educators like that that I knew that would be wonderful at teaching people how to use this technology in the classroom. Um, Steve Isaacs is just brilliant. He's actually out of New Jersey. I kind of found out that there's this network of people that all work together and know each other well and some of these ones do and some don't. Um, Lindy is one of my few trainers that she actually doesn't teach anymore, she just actually trains. So she travels all over the world, training on Microsoft and Google, and basically how to use different pieces of technology in the classroom. Nicole is a good friend of mine here locally, and she's actually our lead trainer, is gonna help us get a little bit more organized on how we onboard trainers and make sure that we're sharing information and then not reinventing the wheel over and over again every time we do a training session. And this is Paul Pedraza, he's actually out of Florida. Josie out of Colorado, Tyler out of Pennsylvania. So you can, as you can see here, we've got quite a team assembled, a team I'm really proud of and excited about. And um, so basically what happens now, if someone calls and they order our PD bundle, I'll show you that real quick. We have two different ones. Uh, there's two headsets that are premier in virtual reality. Right now it's the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive. If you're looking at a high-end, high-definition experience. Um, the Oculus Rift is probably the most popular right now, but really for us it's just a matter of who's gonna come together with the pieces we need for enterprise deployment in an enterprise environment. And I'll, to be honest, um, Oculus and Vive are kind of running neck and neck. They're both paying attention to the education market. They're both developing applications, but neither one of them has a true education skew for me yet. And neither one of them has application deployment figured out. Right now we are white gloving and hand holding every single bundle that we sell. But for example, this bundle right here includes the Oculus. So it's 10 machines, 10 headsets. And then what would happen is 
if you bought so a school in Illinois, for example, if they decided to purchase the bundle, we would set up a call between one of our trainers and maybe it's Zach, maybe it's Mindy, maybe it's even somebody from Ohio, depending on the time frame and needs of the district. And they would have that intro call and talk about curriculum goals and curriculum needs. And they would actually design the training around what the school's goals and wants are. I think that the real trap with virtual reality is that it's so cool that you run the op a risk, I should say, of it becoming just a really fun, cool thing. The last thing that you want to hear is, oh, I tried VR and it was really neat. That's, a, that's neat. It's great. I love maker spaces. That's something fun. But what we're looking to do is see this actually impact the classroom. For teachers, for it's a, it's a hard time to be a teacher. And I, I wouldn't want to have the, the pressure of standing in front of these tech savvy kids who are so stimulated all the time. I have four kids of my own. So kids are harder to reach today than they ever were. They're just they have so many opportunities. They're so much further ahead of us than what we're used to. So really as a teacher right now to try and get these kids engaged and excited about something is not an easy task. And we really feel like virtual reality is the classroom of the future. With virtual reality, you can take a field trip to anywhere in the world. You can bring, you can bring anything anywhere. You can dissect frogs without buying supplies. You can do a virtual chem lab. Virtual reality really completely changes what our opportunities are. And um, we really believe that it's going to change what the classroom looks like in the future. Um, so what we're doing is we designed that uh, very strategic geared PD is teaching teachers not just how to use virtual reality, but how to teach with virtual reality in their classroom. Um, we had an expo here yesterday, for example, and we actually designed some lesson plans where we ran the teachers through what it was like to be in the classroom where they pretended to be the students and we ran them through the station. So they might have, like in this scenario, they had six machines in the back of the classroom and they would run through the different project stations. And when it was their turn to go through, we did a, one about getting to know the cell. So they would actually go through and do their projects at the table and then they would shift through in groups, the virtual reality station where they would actually put on a headset and go into a, the body and into a cell and actually look at a cell in virtual reality. So it's pretty crazy. Um, I'm dating myself a little bit, but you know, we grew up watching the magic school bus and you watch somebody go into the scratch on Johnny's knee and it's a cartoon and that's, what kids can experience now is so far from that, so so much more impactful. Um, this is the first time too, I can remember when uh, virtual reality, or one one first came out. I had um, my favorite question, how's it gonna affect test scores, Anna, if I go one to one? I would never in a million years say that it's gonna affect test scores to say that you have a laptop in every student's hand. I think it's a good thing. I think it's impactful. I think it's gonna teach kids how to be savvy with systems and skills that they need for the real world, but is it gonna actually affect test scores? I, I won't make that claim, but virtual reality in the classroom used right, I believe this technology does affect test scores. There's tons of information out there about retention and actually learning while doing and how that affects the way that the brain retains information. This kind of technology, this affects test scores. Um, so I, it's, it's really, really exciting to be on, and we're definitely on the front end um, of something that I feel like is actually going to transform education. So there, here's some different types of ways to deploy in the classroom, um, compliments of our friends at Foundry 10. The hot seat model is when you have one student, they might be hooked up to a projector and everybody kind of watches. My favorite model is this centers model, where you have a small lab of VR stations and you break into groups and go through. And it's not that this is my favorite because it's the best, more that I just think it's the most attainable for different size districts. Um, obviously, I don't think that they're gonna have, people aren't gonna buy one high-end VR station and headset for every student. And, 
it doesn't work that easily right now. And then the teamwork, there are some really cool apps coming out. For example, there's one um, being developed by a company that we're working with, Filament Games, right now, where you actually have uh, a mineral-based study where the one person is using it and the other kids can actually be a part of the application using cell phones. So it really creates a team environment. There are tons and tons of applications coming out that are very, very impactful. Here are a few examples of different VR applications that I think have a lot of potential in the classroom. This history space race, Apollo 11, is a very, very popular one. Um, time machine, back to dinosaur land. There's a Google Earth application. A lot of you guys have seen the bike like we had at ICE. It's amazing to me that we're implicating um, changing PE with virtual reality, but there's tons of opportunity there. I know that that company too, Verzoom, that um, has the bikes, has an opportunity for people to design applications. And I think that if somebody grabs that and goes with it, I could really see or you have this bike and you're riding through VR. I have a third grader right now, and I know third to fifth grade, every time this time of year, you start losing kids because they wanna be outside, they're bored, they get kind of amped up in the classroom. And this type of technology, you could put a couple of these in the back of the classroom, and instead of having kids race bikes or canoes or do all of the different things that they're showing here, you could design an application where maybe they're using their body and you turn, you use your, there's triggers on the bike. You could actually have them doing multiplication tables or all sorts of different opportunities by using this bike and actually burning off a little steam too. So I think the opportunities are just, we're not even understanding fully where this is all going. But it's really exciting. Um, any questions or anything? <clears throat> Again, if, if there's any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask them in real time or just post them to the chat. Uh, no questions, Anna, in the chat so far. Okay. So that's just a little bit about what we're doing and where we're at. Um, it's been really a, a big, big process, but I feel like we're on the, tra on the right track. It honestly is transforming and changing constantly. Um, every time I think I have it done, I have a phone call or run into someone or something changes and we change direction a little bit. My marketing people are literally ready to kill me, I think, because I get a new idea and come back and say, change everything we've been doing and start this way. Um, but we're definitely making a lot, of uh, a lot of headway and things are going very well. And um, yeah, that's really kind of the primary stuff that we would do. I would say some of the really nice things too about what we're doing is you've got high-end computers that you can use for AutoCAD, drafting, anything. So when you're buying a computer like this, it do, it's not just limited to, um, it's not just limited to gaming or virtual reality. You can use the systems for anything. Uh, gaming clubs are really taking off. I know there's eSports scholarships at, in a, the University of Illinois. I just saw something come through for Utah. And actually, even in North Dakota, a couple of the colleges are starting to pick up on eSports and offer scholarships. Um, makes my heart feel good because I have a 10-year-old that likes to sit on his iPad. I just keep telling myself every time I see him on it that maybe he's paying for his college. At least that's what I'm hoping. So, um, yeah, there's tons and tons of opportunity. I know there's some other competition out there, too. I feel like our prices are really reasonable per seat. And uh, the value is really good for what we're offering. So um, just something very, very exciting. And yeah, I don't really have much else. If anybody has any questions or is working on any particular project, um, or if they want something that's a little outside of what you see in our typical bundles or our typical gaming machines, um, one of my reps just emailed me recently. He said, I have somebody looking for 16 gaming machines. What should I send them? And um, there's a very, very easy answer to that. It depends on what they're going to do with it. So um, we've got a whole team of engineers that are available. If you're looking at doing something, call us and let us know what the implement implementation plan is. And we're glad to design something and put it together that fits your specific needs and goals. We love this little Atom. Um, it's a 
Skull Canyon Nup built-in graphics. It's fantastic for MOBAs and um, lots of different gaming applications. Not virtual reality, but definitely a great option for a lot of the games that people are using. So, yeah. I think that's it, Jad. I'll talk a long time if you let me. <laughs> no, no, this has been very, very informative and great. Uh, so I guess I have a question. Uh, so you talked a little bit about some of the content partners you have, like Filament Games. Uh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about kind of other folks you're talking to in terms of partnerships so that people, when they kind of invest in the gaming console, that um, what kind of, of content access they'll have? Yeah, definitely. So Filament, Filament Learning has been amazing. They, uh, they're still in development for their virtual reality one. But whenever anybody buys gaming PCs, they get a free 30-day trial to the Filament Learning Suite, which doesn't take high-end PCs to run. But I love the idea of promoting gaming for learning because I believe it promotes development. So they've been a really great partner. And they're definitely hard at work. I think they're working on phase two of a different um, grant that they'll get. Uh, Shell Games has been another awesome partner, and they are putting together a Chem Lab application, and we're very excited about that. That is going to look, they're at, I think, the third phase of their Chem Lab application. We're hoping to see that out this fall. Um, another company that we're working with is actually out of Davenport, Iowa. They're called Discovery VR, and they actually have a 24-pack of textbooks, virtual reality textbooks that they're developing. Um, very, very interesting concept that they have. It's all STEM-focused. Um, they have, you'll have a video application, an assessment tool. They have a teacher dashboard included, which I really like. Um, some of the graphics aren't as high-end as some of the stuff you're going to see, like with the Shell Games applications. But I like that they've really focused on the education piece and the teacher assessment part because I think that that'll be very appealing to a lot of different teachers. Um, they also have a grant writer on staff, which um, I thought was fairly fabulous. And I think he's pretty open to putting together different things for people if they're interested in learning more. Um, so if anybody's looking for an introduction to them, I would be glad to make one. The way that they're doing their software too, I thought the pricing was fairly reasonable. We can include it in our bundle. Our bundle actually includes some money for applications. So um, they gave us kind of a four pack of books at a really reasonable price if they fit into the curriculum goals of the school. Um, otherwise, if they're doing a grant for you and you're looking to deploy across a district, I think they're just charging $5,000 a building for the software. And obviously, if you're getting a grant, that makes it an even better price. So that was very, very interesting. And I love that it was a Midwest company. They're very big on virtual field trips. So that's a big, big part of what their, their textbooks are looking at. Um, honestly, new software comes out every single day. I uh, was so far, every call we've had, every application we've been able to we've been asked for, we've been able to find something that applies. Um, physical education was a big surprise that there was an option there with the resume bike art. I didn't really um, expect all the different implications for art and money obviously is always an issue, but as you're starting to look at a curriculum in art, you've got a lot of money spent on art supplies. So it was kind of neat to see the options come through with art applications. Um, Tilt Brush is very, very popular. Um, there's a fee for the software, but it's very, very minimal compared to what you'll spend on art supplies. Um, I'm researching one right now for welding, which I think is really interesting. Um, welding supplies are very expensive too. Same with Chem Lab will be that uh, Shell Games is working on. Um, a lot of these devices will pay for themselves very easily with that five-year warranty. Fantastic. <clears throat> Other questions? All right, I'll, I'll go again. Uh, so I know uh, you're doing some work uh, uh, with Zach in the eSports arena. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit more about kind of what's happening there and some of the successes you're seeing? Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of people are embracing the gaming club and what the 
opportunity is for the gaming club. I think we all recognize that there is a level of student that just as educators, are, they're hard to get our hands on. They're the kids that come in every day, they go to class, they do their work, they go home, and they, they're not gonna be in speech and drama, they're not gonna be in sports necessarily. They're just kind of hard to, to get, they're that peripheral student. And uh, gaming clubs are a great way to pull those kids into the fold, and a lot of schools are just having great success for the, with that, with very minimal resources output, actually. Um, it's also a great equalizer. You think about um, how you can have the high school quarterback and sitting next to a kid that potentially maybe would never be even having a conversation with him and you get them in a, on a gaming club and all of a sudden you have a great equalizer there. Um, we're all IT people here probably on this call too and we all also realize the really successful people that we have in IT have developed social skills, good, strong social skills that make the difference for them, a huge difference for them and what their ability is on for the future. When you're going in and a tech savvy person that can communicate well and deliver solutions in a clear and easy and decisive manner, I, they can run the world. And I think a lot of schools are understanding that and starting to build up clubs to bring those kids forward and actually give them that opportunity to develop those social skills and be proud of a ability that they maybe have and aren't getting to take advantage of. So the gaming clubs are really, really taking off. I feel like it's still fairly new. There's definitely pockets across the country where they're very popular and less in areas that aren't. If you can find support from a college, Colleges, I've, we've seen some real headway with gaming clubs. Um, so I feel like the colleges are kind of running the K-12 a, a little bit. But that's good. They're all following there. Yeah, and there, there's a, uh, a blog uh, that's called eGamer that actually mm -hmm. has a playbook of how to actually instantiate a gaming club and what are the best practices to actually make them successful. And I think Anna, you, you actually uh, helped uh, with one of the esports events that's happening in Illinois, right? And uh, kind of setting the platform for that. Uh, I think that's coming next month, maybe, or maybe this month. Um, I don't know. I, we have Mind Fair coming up really soon. And now that, that actually is going to be pretty neat. That's in Texas. Mind Fair is a, uh, kind of a I guess I would say consumer facing almost but it's family facing to get the family more involved in esports and gaming and really focusing on uh, obviously Minefair so you're going to get the Minecraft build um, and just kind of trying to pull gaming to the very next level um, a very very big opportunity there um, I don't know the local one yeah, so uh, Zach Gilbert actually is working on a esports tournament uh, in Northern Illinois, and, and uh, oh yeah, yeah. So I forget what the actual platform is for for the, the actual game, but I know that he's ha ha highly leveraging uh, the so, gravity, yeah, the gravity uh, suite for uh, enabling that. And uh, you know, initial tests and preparations have been very successful, and I, and I think he's got a lot of really positive feedback and, and great things to say about Gravity Gaming with respect to how it's been able to enhance that eSports experience. Yeah, yeah, it's, they're kind of, he, uh, he's definitely spent a lot of time with the different engineers that we have on the phone here discussing setups and machines and what's the best equipment for what games and uh, his passion is very, very inspiring. I think with all of, I mean, the Zach Gilberts of the world really are the key to any of this, you know, the key to a successful gaming club, the key to a successful virtual reality deployment. It's finding those rock stars and uh, getting them. Sorry about that, guys. It's finding those rock stars and putting them in place and giving them the tools that they need to succeed. Um, we all know all educators aren't created equal. All, all tech people aren't created equal and you can take a very a very promising program and give it to the wrong person and have it fail so with virtual reality with esports with gaming clubs just finding that person that has their heart and soul into it to take the lead is really the key to, i believe to a successful deployment one of my favorite questions that i get asked from people is 
where should I start? Should I start with science or should I start with math? And um, the, the answer to that question isn't very simple. Um, you start where your, where your rock stars are. And if they're in science, you start with science. If they're in art, you start with art. You, you start where you have the right people in place to make something successful. Because if you don't, then you'll have invested a lot of money in something that won't go far. You really need somebody with that heart to push it to the next level. And a successful gaming club is somebody that loves gaming and wants to engage those kids and take that next level. Absolutely. So Anna, if I, if I wanted to get started with um, something that, that, you know, is virtual field trips or, you know, leverages, filaments or shell or discovery VR, uh, you've got a collection of different um, offerings here, Impact, Eclipse, Nova, Force, Atom, etc. What's a good kind of starter package and is there upgrade options or kind of, there's a lot of different suites and if I'm not like an expert in terms of gaming platforms kind of can you give some guidance in terms of where i should start and what kind of evolution opportunities there are oh definitely and i what i would say it's just like anything else is that it just depends on what you're going to do if you're looking to get started with virtual reality i would say one of our pd bundles and then it's really just figuring out if you're looking for the big differences between these two bundles would be the headset the vive or the oculus rift um, I wish I could tell you just straight out that this one's the best one or that one's the best one, but I feel very much like it's, um, the situation that we ran into with, uh, Blu-ray and HDT, you know, who's going to win. Um, I'd love to pick one and say, this is the one and go forward, but I'm not in any way, shape or form ready to make a commitment to either one. And it's almost been 50-50 on the deployment, who takes what. So between the Oculus and the Vive, picking your headset at this point is just really which personal preference, which one you like the best. So um, to get started, if you're looking to implement VR into the classroom, I would definitely do one of the PD bundles and I would choose the headset that you like the best. If you want to discuss with one of our gamers which one might have the best based on your curriculum goals, we could look at that too. With gaming, um, I would by no stretch of the imagination just say this machine right here is the, the quantum, that's the best gaming club PC. Because that might be overkill if you're running, playing League of Legends and just doing MOBAs. Um, it just really depends on what you're looking to accomplish. A good way to get started with VR in the classroom is doing the bundle. A good way, if you're looking to just add VR into a maker space, you can just buy a single VR ready PC and a headset and you're off and running. Um, it just really depends on how you want to deploy. But we have people here. Um, I, I'm kind of not a huge fan of the one size fits all model because I don't, I don't believe that all schools are created equal. I don't believe that everyone has the same curriculum goals. I don't believe that everyone has the same goals period with their hardware. And that I believe we limit ourselves by saying, this one is the best one for VR when we don't know what applications people are looking to run. We don't know what their intent is. So we try really hard to talk to people about what they're doing and how they plan to deploy before we make hardware recommendations. But we definitely have some really good starts. So. You can go online and look at things and figure out what you need if you're super tech savvy. And if you're not, call us and talk to us about what your goals are and we'll design something that fits you perfectly. Fantastic. Other questions? Um, I have a question um, regarding the potential of utilizing existing hardware. You mentioned something to the effect of VR ready. What does that actually mean? Uh, because we have access to uh, couple of hundred uh, pretty high-end nodes uh, that are available that could be made available as lab gear and that sort of thing. And um, it would be interesting to, to explore opportunities that might exist that haven't been considered for this kind of a purpose. That, that's a great question. So there, there's several different steps in, in virtual reality. You've got Google Cardboard, which you just start the little goggles and you don't need anything for hardware. They're just running on basic cardboard goggles. You've got the phone VR where you put your phone in a headset, 
Um, you need a phone and a $50 to $100 headset to plug it in. When you look at the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive, like I'm talking about, they run on high-powered PCs. And actually, the specs aren't super crazy except for the graphics card. So to find out if any of your PCs are VR ready, you're just going to want to look up what uh, the graphics card is and what the virtual re reality requirements are for the different headsets. And you might find that um, you have a VR ready video card in them, but it's not capable of running the 3D rendering that it takes for certain applications too. So always step up a little higher past what the minimum requirements are. If you've got a bunch of machines that are ready to go right now, then you might just be looking at sourcing video cards if they have the open ports and the processing and memory power. But the memory and processor power is actually surprisingly reasonable. It's really the graphics card that's really intensive for okay. virtual reality. Right, right. And that was pretty much the expectation in, in that realm. And uh, video cards can range highly in, in price. Uh, depending yeah on their anatomy. Uh, but again, I, I think that this is something that is uh, potentially uh, available uh, to some degree, especially for exploration. Uh, legitimately, we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 256 nodes that we just recently acquired. Uh, and they're, they're pretty high-end machines. They're, they're pretty awesome. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, we might be able to explore that sort of thing. I don't think that they come with a high-end video card because they weren't intended for that uh, when they were uh, originally put together, but they're actually HPC nodes. I, I, would, reading notes. I would say, Bernie, you're in really good shape if you've got the high-end PCs. Just get the video cards that you need. And then the other thing I would caution you is those high-end video cards usually take beastly power supplies. Yep. So you're going to want to make sure that you have the power supply and the systems to support the video card. Yep, yep. But otherwise, yeah, you're probably in great shape, especially if you just want to check it out and see what it looks like. No, I'm, I'm thinking in a more structured fashion, you know, because uh, I, don't, I don't dream small, don't care about small things, care about big things. Uh, <laughs> in this particular perspective, is it potentially possible to look at creating a centrally local lab that can be accessed for many classrooms? Is that even potential? I don't know. Um, I mean, what, what, what can be done uh, in terms of uh, uh, developing a concept where we have uh, the potential to deliver um, you know, uh, crap, that's easily a half a million dollars worth of gear. Yeah. I will say, you know, one of the reasons that I'm such a big fan of the group model with having a few of them in the back of the um, classroom is just experience that I've had over the years with other pieces of technology. Um, right. Mobile labs, one of the most, I've sold thousands and thousands and thousands of mobile labs we've placed in schools over the years. And the biggest thing that you hear from teachers and tech directors over time is, well, I'm not going to use that mobile lab because I went to go use it. I incorporated it into my curriculum. I needed it for this lesson plan. And then someone had it checked out when I needed it. Or maybe somebody didn't plug the systems in when they put it back in the room. Or maybe they didn't leave it in very good shape. And so I was short a couple systems. So one of the things that you lose when you have that central location is the ownership from the teacher. If they design their curriculum around this, which you really want them to for a successful deployment, I feel, and then the technology is not easy for them to get to, easy for them to use or in good working order when they use it, when they go to use it, then they'll stop going to use it. Of and course. it's not that all of those things can't be mediated. They definitely can. You can make sure that you have somebody watching the lab all the time, make sure it's always in good working order. You can have clear checkouts and make sure that you have enough for people to get to when you can. But those are a little bit of the, the challenges that can arise if you're trying to share through a central location. So those are just kind of pitfalls to be aware of and watch out for if you're trying to deploy mass labs that way. Uh -huh. Even though, and I'm not advocating to not do that by any means, because I think that however you can get the technology in people's hands is a wonderful solution. But Okay, is the current technology, I'm going to uh, show my ignorance here real quick. Uh, is the current uh, technology a one-to-one -one correspondence with a headset to a uh, CPU that supports it, or is it one-to-many? It's not one-to-one. -one. Yeah, one PC, one headset, one experience. 
Okay. You can actually see what the students are doing on a display, so but it's yep. not even close to the same experience. So you can watch what they're seeing on a computer monitor, but it's definitely a, it's really a one-to-one -one experience. Okay. So at some point, I imagine that will change, but at least right now, that's where the technology is. Okay, so so lab sizes of 10 normally would dictate that students don't get to participate collectively, that they have to share, uh, take turns, and that sort of yeah. thing. So setting up a lab uh, based on class size would uh, dictate the number of nodes as you expect students. Yep, you'd either have to run them through in groups and have them doing that group style learning, or you'd have to have one for every student and yeah. uh, go through the pieces for that. The other thing is, that, especially if you do the ones with the handheld helds on there, there's some space too that you need for setup if it's an interactive experience. And some people do the, like the textbook company that I mentioned on Victory VR, theirs is not interactive at all. You can sit. And uh, you just sit and watch, and you look at the different. Um, as you look at something for a certain amount of time, it'll select that and move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. But um, it's not interactive. But the interactive portion of this is pretty popular, and has a lot of appeal. So if you had too many of them crammed into an area, you might lose some of that flexibility that you'd have for interaction. Okay. Well, that's interesting, and I, I think that there's some potential for exploration there. Definitely, I'd, I'd like to, to see what we might be able to do with, with that kind of a, a path at some point. Does that make sense, Jeff? <clears throat> no, it sounds, sounds great, and uh, it's a good, good segue into uh, kind of my, one of my last questions. Uh, so, Anna, um, if people are interested in learning more or, or maybe trying to test something out, uh, should they just reach out to you and and or should they should go to info at gravity gaming dot com or how how should they if they want to just reach out to me depending on where they're from I'll just put them in touch with the right person and make sure they get attached to the right resources but yeah I can be a definitely a good starting point and uh, my contact information is pretty easy um, actually I think if you go to about the gravity team here I think yeah see there's our <laughs> kind of goofy pictures. I look good with a mustache, right? Um, but I think you can, can you click here? I thought you could email from here, but it looks like you can't. Um, my email is really easy though. It's just uh, Anna at bitespeed.com and shoot me over an email with any questions and I'll get you connected to the right people and we'll be in good shape. <clears throat> okay, I just posted to the chat for folks uh, and at bitespeed.com. So, thank you. Feel free to uh, reach out to Anna. Um, I'll pause for any kind of remaining questions or, or whatnot. If not, uh, thank you so much, Anna. This has been very, very uh, enlightening and, and informative. So, I really appreciate you taking the time to walk us through some of the great stuff that you're doing with Gravity Gaming and. Um, Look forward to uh, talking again soon. Thank you, Jack. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And this concludes our webinar.